How many of you served in Afghanistan or Central Asia? Wow. OK, so you know the region. But I always like to start with uh, ge a little geography. Let's see if we can get this to go, typically. No, that doesn't work either. OK. All right. So you're familiar with this map. Nonetheless, it's important to keep that geography in mind if you're going to talk about the great game. Now, the great game today, or at least in my definition, uh, is not the great game you read about in Kipling or if you ever saw the Errol Flynn movie Kim, which is based on Kipling. It is not just England versus Russia or the US versus Russia. Today's great game is something completely different. The great game today is a cauldron of intersecting local, regional, and international actors, some of whom are states, some of whom are not, all of whom have important or even vital interest in what's going on in this area of Central Asia, which may, mainly is Afghanistan and the five former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. The Suffix S-T-A-N is from the Turkic word for homeland, so it's the homeland of the Tajiks and so forth. Nonetheless, all of those places have large ethnic minorities. These are not unified ethnic po uh, political entities, and there is some concern, justified or not, that the uh, ethnic issue in these areas could erupt or prevent the formation of a durable, viable state. Those of you who have been in Afghanistan know very well what I'm talking about from the ethnic point of view. It's a mosaic of, of different ethnic groups, languages, and so on. The Tajiks are a Persian population. They look to Iran, historically, for Ir to Iranian culture and Farsi. They are Shiites. That does not mean that they identify with the government of Iran's policies and programs. Nonetheless, there's a long-standing affinity be between them. The others are Sunnis. They are by no means extreme Muslims. They've had that kicked out of them, in a sense, by the Soviets. Their religious organizations are subordinate to the state. But, again, there are fundamentalist groups in the opposition. There are ethnic minorities, and so on. This area is, therefore, a cauldron for a number of reasons. One, as any real estate agent will tell you, location, location, location. You can just see it. Russia, China, Iran, India, Pakistan, all in the neighborhood. Afghanistan as well. And Afghanistan has been and remains a cockpit of interstate rivalry going back at least 200 years, if not more. Third, who are the powers that are playing in the great game. First of all, and this is one of the major differences from the 19th century, Central Asian states today are fully-fledged international actors, wholly sovereign, independent actors. They are subjects, not just objects. They act rather than just being acted upon. That's fundamental. Now, the outside great powers, US, Russia, China, to some degree Turkey. I'm not going to talk much about Turkey because they're a minor player, really. Iran is trying to get in. Obviously, you can see why. India and Pakistan. Non-state groups, the Taliban, insurgent movements affiliated with the Taliban who originated in Central Asia. I'll give you an example, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. You're familiar with that, maybe? Hizb al-Tahir, another group, originally a Palestinian group, but that has now morphed over the 60 years of its existence into a Central Asian group. There probably are other actors. It is not just these groups, however, that are non-state actors. We find the EU having a significant interest in the area, as well as international financial institutions or international agencies of the UN, the World Bank, 
Asian Development Bank, and so forth. All of these entities, for want of a better term, are constantly pulling and pushing with each other. As a result, there is a constant struggle at the local level among Central Asian states, because there are some that want to have a bigger role in the area, and we, among not just Central Asian states, but great actors, the IFIs, non-state organizations, etc. Third, there has been an attempt, mainly by Russia and China, to form regional security organizations. You're familiar with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO. CSTO, formed by Moscow with Central Asian states, it's primarily a military entity. It looks to me and to many others like a kind of son of Warsaw Pact. Those of you may, you know, who go back a few years, remember the old Warsaw Pact. The headquarters are in Moscow. It's dominated by Russian officers. Its program is allegedly to defend Central Asian states against threats of invasion, terrorism, upheaval, and so forth. So far, all they've done is have exercises and constantly reform the command and control structure. But when the rubber hit the road, for example, in 2010, in Kyrgyzstan, when there was an insurgency, and then three months later, a major pogrom between Kyrgyz and Uzbeks, the CSTO was nowhere to be seen. Nobody wanted it to come into action. And it didn't come into action, even though Russian troops were in the plane, ready to go, waiting for the go signal from President Medvedev. Never got it. We'll talk about why. Shanghai Cooperation Organization grows out of the border delimitation treaties between China and the former Soviet states. If you look at the Russo-Chinese border, let's see if I got, oh, back. Uh, if you look at this border over here, right here, goes all the way out to the Pacific and then down. In Soviet times, it was an area of immense rivalry and contention after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. It was necessary because the uh, rapprochement had started already between the Soviet Union and China. It was necessary for all the post-Soviet states to legally demarcate, and China, to legally demarcate this border. They did that in a series of agreements going back from 1991 to 1996. As a result of that experience, which also led, we should point out, to large-scale disarmament along that border, which had been heavily armed, Russia and China came, and mainly China came up with the op idea of a security organization to embrace all these states called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The treaty was made in Shanghai. It is an organization that is supposedly there to defend the members against the three evils, separatism, terrorism, and extremism. It really is an attempt at a collective security treaty organization. It has just been there for the last 11 years. Again, it's very difficult to figure out exactly what it does, but everybody seems to want to be a member. And if you saw the last summit, which just took place two weeks ago, uh, there was an attempt by India, Pakistan, Iran, Mongolia to become members. Turkey was taken in as a uh, discussion as associate. Afghanistan became an observer. India, Pakistan, and Iran, and Mongolia are already observers. But the membership is China, Russia, and the five former Soviet states. That's kind of overlying structure. What are the security challenges here? Well, obviously, if you have this kind of rivalry among great powers, there will be com competition and rivalry among the great powers for influence. Why is this taking place, you may ask. Again, location is critical. Second, energy. This area sits on enormous oil and gas reserves. It also has a lot of other raw materials that people would like, uranium. I need not explain why that's important. Uh, copper and gold and so on. Third, apart from its location and what's in the ground, we learned on 9-11 that you can reach out and touch somebody from here. The threat of Islamic terrorism is one of the things that brings all these governments together because all of them are convinced that if the war in Afghanistan goes badly, and very few people believe that Hamid Karzai will survive an American and ISAF withdrawal very long and stay in power, if things go badly in Afghanistan, they all believe their security will be at risk to a much greater degree 
from terrorism, drug running, and fundamentalism emanating from Afghanistan, potentially even with the supportive elements of Pakistan. And we don't have to, I think, go into a lot of detail as to what that means. But what it shows is that the Pakistanis, for example, who are very seriously trying to create what they call a strategic hinterland here, dispose of instruments that are very classical. This is not the first time somebody has supported terrorist groups or armed insurgents against their neighbors in order to coerce them into a form of compliance. But we see that as a threat. They see the fall of Afghanistan as a major threat, and they want assurances that if the ISAF withdraws, that Afghanistan will be in some measure guaranteed against collapse and themselves as well. Furthermore, this area is important because we have rivalries within it. The two main rivalries, the two main rival states within Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, both of whom are large and think that they should play a larger role in the area. Kazakhstan's orientation is largely economic. It wants to play a major economic role in Central Asia and beyond. Uzbekistan is largely a military actor in the region, the largest military, and it wants to play a dominant role. Now, the way they go about it is different. We'll try to get into that, but they are rivals. There is, and this explains another factor. All of these governments are determined to protect their independence they, against any threat to their sovereignty and independence. They know full well what the Russians and Chinese are up to. They have no illusions on this score, I can assure you. But because of the nature of the origin that they have as Soviet republics and their desire to preserve their independence, and third, because they are all, to one or another degree, autocratic despotisms, it is virtually impossible to get effective regional cooperation. You have regional security systems, the CSTO, the SCO. Neither of them has functioned effectively when the chips are down. Maybe that will change, but up till now, it's not been the case. So you have an absence of effective regional cooperation and growing rivalries to the point where Uzbekistan is more often than not on the verge of conflict with its neighbors, particularly Kyrgyzstan, over here, and Tajikistan down there. The issues are water in particular, but not only. Ethnic issues, water, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan have no oil, they have a lot of water. Uzbekistan has some oil, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan have a lot of oil and gas, as much more than Uzbekistan even. Uzbeks have an extremely wasteful irrigation economy built by the Soviets, which is a great form of social control of the peasant population. They require a lot of water, which is used wastefully. They don't like the Tajiks taking that water because the Tajiks desperately need it and to convert it into hydroelectric power for Tajikistan or to, and for exports abroad. The same is true for Kyrgyzstan. There are constantly manifestations of what you would call economic warfare between Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Constantly. Again, no regional cooperation. Now that means that when the uh, US and ISAF pull out of Afghanistan, in effect, there is no organized security structure to deal with any possibility of a spillover from Afghanistan into Central Asia. Now, nature and politics abhor a vacuum. In the absence of an effective regional security mechanism, you have a greater opportunity for the great powers, all of whom have key interests. Now, for Russia, China, and Iran, and for pa India and Pakistan, those are vital interests. For the United States, I'm not sure that Central Asia is a vital interest, but after 9-11, the suppression of terrorism is, and is stated as such in US strategy documents. So there is an ongoing battle here which utilizes all the instruments of the dime, not just military power. And I would argue that there is one state that appears to be gradually improving its position, and there are a number who are trying to improve their position, it's not clear that they are, and there are some whose position is beginning to slip. The state that is beginning to improve its position is China. 
Now for China, this is a, a vital area because China's northwest, up here, Xinjiang, frontier area is historically an area of contention. It was an area of contention between the Soviets and the Tsars and China. It has China's large Muslim minorities. It is China's largest energy producing province and it has China's nuclear test site. Also, the Muslim population is in a state of con constant ferment against the government in Beijing. The government in Beijing has attacked Islam. It is colonizing the area with Han Chinese. For a long time, the area has been one of the more backward areas of China. Now the Chinese are pouring money in there because, like good Leninists, they think that if you ha that nationality problems or ethnic problems arise out of economic stratification, if you remove eth economic stratification, and if you flood the area with colonists, uh, uh, just to keep sure, uh, you, th then uh, you can keep a lid on it. But it, it is a vital area for China, and it is vital for China, therefore, that the Central Asian governments that emerged after 1991 not support their co-religionists in Xinjiang. So the condition of Chinese support, recognition, investment, and trade in Central Asia is you do not help your cousins, or else. And the Chinese have subtle ways of uh, enforcing this, or else. To give you an example, and this, this is actually a medieval tactic that goes back. They have, in the past, uh, essentially held Central Asian businessmen as hostages in China as a kind of collateral for good behavior. So you know, now and then, these kinds of things happen, but the Chinese are conscious of the fact that they are strong. They are conscious of their growing strength. They like to throw their weight around. They are insensitive, if you like, to native aspirations, yet they think that Central Asia is a model of what Chinese influence and power can do to build friendship. It's a classic colonial mentality. Central Asian governments resent it. They fear Chinese power, they much more than they fear Russia, because Russia, they know, these are all, for the most part, Russian-trained, Soviet-trained elites. They understand Russian. They speak Russian. They look to Russian culture. They understand the mentality of the Soviet and then now post-Soviet leaders. China, on the other hand, is a much more difficult problem. But they cannot get away from it, so they need to balance China, even as they accept its goods. Russia and the U.S., I would argue, are slipping. India and Pakistan are fighting to maintain their position or expand it, mainly in Afghanistan. Now, those of you who are in Afghanistan, and I think that's almost all of you, may have seen instances of Indo-Pakistani rivalry, not just sort of intelligence and political uh, rivalry, but clear political rivalry. If you read the Pakistani press, and you know, it's a, good, it's a good way now and then to sort of clear the cobwebs and you know, eliminate any, any obsessive anger you might have about anything because you see true paranoia and true obsession. Uh, the Pakistanis are absolutely convinced that the Indians are coming over the next ridge and are trying to take over Afghanistan to stab them in the back. Therefore, they have to do things against India and Afghanistan, one of the reasons they support all these terrorist organizations there and against India and Kashmir, and one of the reasons why they try to get into Central Asia. So Afghanistan, even as the U.S. and ISAF are pulling out, is still a cockpit of international rivalry. India also is trying to get into Central Asia for obvious reasons. Historically, and this is true even you know, in the British imperial period, there was a lot of trade. Now that Central Asia has energy, the India and Pakistan desperately need energy. So even though Pakistan and India are enemies, they are joining together in a major pipeline proposal called the TAPI line, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, to provide gas from Turkmenistan to India. The U.S. supports this. Russia is trying to get into it to subvert the U.S. position. And China is trying to build its own pipelines because they understand that this is part of the larger U.S. design to reorient Central Asian economies away from dependence on Russia and towards greater exposure to the global markets. China, for one, but also now South Asia and even Europe. And we see this competition not just in Afghanistan between Pakistan and India, but of course among the great powers, 
over energy. The energy competition is fierce. There is a series of attempts, or some successful, some in the planning stage, to build mainly gas pipelines. And I'll explain the difference why gas is more important than oil from Central Asia to either to Europe or, as we said, to Asia, which are major subjects of international rivalry. Now, the difference is, if you are in the market for oil, you can buy oil anywhere. All you need to go is to the New York or Rotterdam markets, put down you know, what you want to buy, how much oil you want to buy, at what price you'll be able to buy it. The oil is there, it comes on tankers, and it comes, and it's delivered. So it's very difficult for anybody to interfere with that market. The price is set, it's traded on the world market, it's a fungible commodity. Because you could say I'm buying oil in Rotterdam, and it doesn't matter if the oil is West Texas crude or Central Asian crude. I mean, there's a price differential, obviously, but you're still getting a set price. Gas is something entirely different. Gas is a long-term marriage. Not only is it a long-term marriage, it's an arranged marriage between the parents of the bride and groom-to-be. If you want to buy gas in large scale, in large volumes, you have to negotiate a pipeline. And as I said, we have one suggestion, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. The other is what we call a Trans-Caspian pipeline. Gas from Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan and maybe ultimately Uzbekistan through the Caspian Sea, right there, through Azerbaijan and probably Georgia into the Black Sea or into Turkey and then out into Europe. That is also the possibility called Nabucco. You may have heard of the Nabucco pipeline. It's named after the Verdi Opera because Somebody who, I guess the Italian commissioner is an opera fan, so he liked the name, or because Nabucco goes back to the biblical king of what is Iraq. Whatever reason, that's the project. We support all of those pipelines, the Tappy pipeline and Nabucco. Why? Well, in the case of the Tappy pipeline, to go back, Pakistan and India desperately need energy. Any account you read of that tells you so. However, the alternative is either Turkmenistan or Iran. We are going to block any effort by Iran to get into the international energy market, period. We're not going to allow them to get technology, if we can help it, and we have, and we're going to block attempts to get them to, to buy their gas. Now, this creates problems for India and Pakistan because they need the gas. Well, okay, build the pipeline from Turkmenistan to India. Well, the problem is this. First of all, it's in, there's an immense geological risk. This is earthquake country, apart from anything else. Second, you're going to a four sovereign state, each one of whom is going to charge taxes, uh, transit fees, et cetera. Furthermore, they all have to agree on the volume of gas that they are prepared to buy, at what price they're going to buy it, and for how long in order to justify construction of that pipeline. And you can imagine what it means to get four governments to come to terms, even if they all liked each other, and that's not the case, what it means to get four governments to come to terms on this project. For, then, who's going to put the money up to build the pipeline? Because these are billion, billions of dollars worth of projects. These are not something you just build overnight. And therefore, th there are long-term contracts. You're going to be locked in for 10, 20, 30 years, whatever the case is. As I said, gas is an arranged marriage. The other alternative is the Trans-Caspian pipeline to Europe. That pipeline undermines not only Iran, which wants ideally to be able to sell freely to Europe, it strikes directly at the most important instrument of Russian domestic and foreign policy, namely Russia's ability to try to dominate the European and CIS, Commonwealth of Independent States, gas markets. Therefore, the Russians regard Nabucco and the Trans-Caspian pipeline as a plot to undermine their interests, and they block it every chance they get. It, if you follow the energy discussions in the paper of all these countries, you see this going on. The Russians have their alternative pipeline that they want, to, they want to build. They are trying to get into TAPI for the same reason. They don't want 
somebody else to sell gas to South Asia without them being involved. They want to keep their hands on Central Asia. But they are slipping. They can't compete economically with China. Their military is in no position as of yet to project sustained power into Central Asia. It is in interesting in this regard. And with, this is a lesson that is about to be forgotten. We are the only power in history that successfully sustained long-term power projection into Central Asia in modern times. The Russians tried it in 79. In Afghanistan, they, seven years later, it was clear already they were losing. They were out by 89. We've been there for 14 years. Well, we, we will be there for 14 years once ISAF completes. And we could have stayed. It's not a question of our military capabilities. It's political and economic pressures at home. <coughs> Russians can't maintain that level of uh, power projection. China doesn't want to, even if it could, and it's debatable whether it could. Therefore, the instruments they are using are as much economic as anything else. And since it's an economic competition, China is winning out over Russia. Just to give you an example, they had the summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization last week. The Chinese walked away with deals. They're trying to build their pipeline through Afghanistan. They just offered another loan, a second loan of $10 billion to Central Asian states. They signed deals for railways, infrastructure, mines, projects all over Central Asia. They, are getting 65, they will be getting 65 billion cubic meters of gas from Turkmenistan on a pipeline that Turkmenistan built to China. That's originally, it, it's going to take also, when it's completely finished, Kazakh and maybe Uzbek gas go through Turkmenistan and into China, like that. Now, that gas used to go to Russia and Europe. Russians tried to block Turkmenistan. The Chinese made themselves available to Turkmenistan. Within three years of the original signing of the project, the pipeline was built. The Russians signed a major pipeline deal with Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan in 2007, precisely to counter the Chinese and, again, to try and keep Turkmenistan in their fold. That pipeline still hasn't been built. Shows you the difference right there. Chinese built it. They Originally, they're getting, they were getting 30 to 40 BCM a year. So now they're going to be getting 65. They have options to, uh, and are exploring the most lucrative fields in Turkmenistan as we speak. Russia still hasn't gotten anything to show for its effort. There's a difference there, and it's not an accidental one. The Chinese are now the major financial center. If a central Asian state wants to raise capital on an international financial market, it doesn't go to New York. It goes to Shanghai or Hong Kong. That's power. It's not military power, but it's real power. The U.S. is still militarily able to project large amounts of power into Central Asia, and, uh, and there are substantial economic benefits that accrue through the Northern Distribution Network, the NDN. The NDN is going to close up in two years. We have instead of, quote, a Silk Road project, which is to restore the ancient Silk Road. The Silk Road basically was, if you've read about Marco Polo, it was basically the road from China through here we want it to go through the Caspian, so it averts Russia into the Caucasus and then back into Europe and so on. Unfortunately, once you get past the rhetoric, Secretary Clinton's speeches and Ambassador Blake's speeches, that's the Assistant Secretary for Central Asia, there's no there there. There's hardly any money allocated in the budget. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee published a major report arguing for this last year. There's been silence from the White House. In other words, once we leave Afghanistan, it is very debatable whether the U.S. has a strategy. You know, if you don't have a strategy, and again, what I'm talking about here by a strategy is not just a military strategy, but a, a phenomenon, not to use the word strategy twice, a phenomenon that amalgamates or integrates all the elements of the dime towards the achievement of certain postulated objectives which are deemed to be in your interest. If you don't have that, you're acting in an ad hoc, reactive, uncoordinated manner, and what's more, you don't have the resources to play in this area. Now again, whether or not Central Asia is of vital importance to the United States as such is a question for this administration and whoever's elected in November to decide. But assuming that they both decide that it's important, let alone vital, then you've got to put, as Ob Obama says, skin in the game. You've got to put your chips on the table. We are not doing that. That's why I say Russia is slowly 
but steadily giving ground to China in economics. And we are because we don't have a coordinated vision and strategy or the resources to back it up. As you all know, I don't have to talk about sequestration in the budget. You know, we've all heard this. You're going to hear more. But as, given the pressures on the U.S. foreign and military budgets, how much are we going to uh, allocate to Central Asia? Ask yourself. Are we going to, and are we going to get private investors, besides maybe energy companies and mining companies, to go in there in a big way, to build infrastructure, roads, <coughs> airports, railways, terminals, all those things. China's doing that. You read about Chinese firms, you know, building roads, highways, airports, infrastructure, telecommunications. I don't read about Americans there. I don't think that's because Central Asians don't want American capital. I don't think American capital is interested. And it's not going to be, again, unless the state, that is the government, gives them reasons to go and, and support. At the same time, all of these states face major domestic challenges. I left that for the last point. <coughs> My colleague at SSI, Max Manwaring, several years ago wrote a book about, a you know, uh, study about failing states, places like Afghanistan, maybe now Syria, which is kind of coming apart. In all of these places, what we find is what Max called illegitimate governance. That's his term. What is illegitimate governance? You've seen it. It's Afghanistan. Massive corruption, massive authoritarianism, criminality up and down the whole state apparatus. Local governments, central governments don't account to anybody. Concentration of power in the executive, mass poverty, wide distribution uh, uh, in income, few rich, many poor small middle class, not, and not an independent middle class, like in this country or in Western Europe. Government by clan, by faction, or uh, to use uh, an old French term, the government of pals, gouvernement de camarade, was the old French term in the 30s. These are governments that have great difficulty keeping up. Now they all know, therefore, that the main threat to their security in Central Asia is internal, it's not external. Even though the Central Asian governments all say that Afghanistan after, cars, after we leave could become a major threat, they're not prepared to do very much about it. They certainly are not prepared to come together and coalesce to form a regional security operation because to them, the real threat is domestic. We are there to protect them against the external threat. And when we go, they'll try to find somebody else. But precisely because they know that they have major problems at home, First of all, they regard any opposition as fundamentalist Islamist op uh, terrorism, and they throw them in jail and beat them up, and, or worse. If you really want to read about gruesome governments, read about Uzbekistan's handling of dissidents. It makes Bashir Assad look like a Sunday school teacher. Therefore, these governments all believe themselves, in some way or another, to be walking on the edge of a volcano. Uzbekistan recently banned all internet communications at its schools. And I think you could figure out why. I don't have to elucidate on that for you. Tajikistan called home all the students who were studying in Iranian religious schools and has now launched its own campaign against Islam or to enforce a state version of Islam on those people. Not uncommon. Draconian anti-terrorist laws and so forth. Kazakhstan is the most benevolent of these states. Nonetheless, it is very much an autocratic state, and you don't criticize the head of government or the government and get away with it. Kyrgyzstan is trying to be a democracy, but it is also a weak state. Many think it's a failing state. Tajikistan almost certainly is a failing state. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan are all strong autocracies. But when the leader goes, who knows what will happen, particularly in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Six years ago, the original leader of Turkmenistan died suddenly of a heart attack. He may have been helped. Uh, we don't know. But at the time, and I wrote an SSI study about this. You can find it on our website. Every Central Asian official who commented on this was worried that this could lead to war, first of all, within Turkmenistan and in the region more broadly. Why? Because they understand the domestic dynamics of their situation. So if the main threat is internal, 
and you have all these powers with a track record of neo-imperial outlook and, and record, your foreign policy then becomes one of what they call multi-vector. It becomes a balancing game. I'm balancing China, I'm balancing Russia, I'm balancing the US, the EU, Iran, Turkey, international financial institutions, and so on. Because you don't want to let anybody get too much influence and sovereignty. It is therefore imperative for these guys to develop their state capability. The Kazakhs have succeeded to a remarkable degree. The Uzbeks, the state capability remains to be seen because when Karimov goes, he's 72, we have no idea what's going to come next, and in Turkmenistan, the same is true. But multi-vector multi policies, omnibalancing, as the political science calls it, is the name of the game of these states, precisely because of the great game that we've talked about. Therefore, they want us there. We are an indispensable balance. They know full well that we are, do not have the means or capability to, to make the threats against them that Russia and China do. What they don't like is that we keep talking about democracy, even though, to be honest, US policy does not make democracy promotion a high level. That's not the highest goal in, in Central Asia. Security is. Democracy comes forth. It, nonetheless, they want us there. They want our support. They want our benefits. They want our resources. We just orchestrated a $100 million loan for uh, Uzbekistan from the World Bank, for example. But if we're not going to be there, they're going to have to continue to balance among themselves. And let me give you an example of how that worked to conclude. I mentioned the ethnic pogroms in 2010 between uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz and Uth Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan. You may remember about it. It was a lot of news at the time. It was at this time of the year. It happened at the same time as the summit of the SCO, which was in Tashkent that year. Now, when these pogroms started, it was, had been very clear that the Russians were looking for an excuse even before to get into the Kyrgyzstan and to get permanent military placement and bases. They got bases, but they wanted more. And they, and they said so publicly. You could see it in the press. Uzbekistan, which has its own ambitions and does, looks very balefully on Russian objectives, didn't want any foreign intervention in Central Asia, least of all on behalf of Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan, because if anybody's going to intervene, it's going to be us, and they weren't interested in doing that because they didn't want to set up the precedent. And they saw that the Russians were doing this. Moreover, as I said, the Russians had their airborne troops at the airport, in the planes, ready to go, waiting for President Medvedev to say go, or no go. Since this is the summit of the SCO, all the leaders of the states are coming to Tashkent. So the president of, Tash of Uzbekistan, Islam Karimov, goes to the airport, and you know, there's a protocol. You greet a head of state, there's a picture, there's what we call grip and grin. You say some nice words about the relationship between the two states, and everybody goes away happy. And everything was correct for the governments of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Russia. Everything's fine. Hu Jintao comes into town. Karimo goes out to the airport, gives this fulsome speech talking about the 1,000-year relationship between the state of Uzbekistan and, quote, the Celestial Kingdom. Not the People's Republic of China. The Celestial Kingdom. Then they have a tete-a-tete, -tete, the two of them together for several hours, where they have a discussion of all outstanding security issues, in other words, Kyrgyzstan, and they make it clear we oppose any foreign intervention. No foreign intervention took place. Why? Perfect example of balancing. I balance towards China to keep Russia from dominating. And Central Asian states have told American scholars that when the SCO meets, it's important for them to have that group because with China in the room, quote, Russia cannot play its games. So we're going to leave there in a year, 18 months or so. It's not at all clear what's going to substitute for American presence and whether any, the next administration, whoever that is, will think that Central Asia is important to the US other than as a place from which there may be terrorism or energy. But is it going to be vital? I don't know. None of us do. Will our resources allow us to play a game there? Perhaps, but very debatable. So we have the means of conducting, a, or the will and the vision to conduct an effective overall security strategy for the region? 
highly dubious. But that does not mean that the great game will stop. Even if our profile goes down, as the uh, Turkish proverb says, the dogs bark, but the caravan goes on. The game will continue. We could give this lecture in two years. The US will have a role, maybe smaller, but everybody else will still be in there trying to gain influence, trying to gain lodgements of power, projection capabilities, what have you, energy, and so on. And they will all be worried about all the threats we talked about, water, domestic insurgency, terrorism, state collapse, et cetera. In other words, we may have to come back. Maybe not as robustly as we have now, but this is not an area that's going to disappear from world politics as an area of contention, rivalry, and quite possibly conflict. Thank you.